Hey, uh, good morning. My name is Jason Hirschberger. As Pastor said, I am a uh, U.S. missionary with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. Uh, you could put the first picture up there. Sorry, I'm traveling solo uh, this morning. Today is a crazy day. Uh, I'm starting it with you, and then I get to lead a group of college students this afternoon through how the Bible was made, put together, how we can read it and hear the voice of God, and then I get to end it by baptizing three college students in water. So it's going to be a good day. Um, we have the first picture. My wife, she's better looking than me, so you'll want to see it. There she is. So my wife, Meg, and I, we've been married uh, 21 years, and uh, we were high school sweethearts, and her and her family led me to Jesus, and I'm super thankful for that. Uh, but she's pretty incredible. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we are busy folks. We have five kids. Uh, so my daughter Madison is 14. My daughter Gabriella is 12. My first son Titus is 10. My next daughter Abigail is 7. And our little baby in the middle, that's Moses. He is 10 months old. You can go to the next slide. Um, so kind of a cool special picture for me. So uh, the little sign there with my last name on it, that was my grandfather Harshbarger's barn, uh, which was torn down. It was 100 some years old, so got to keep it and uh, had our, our last name put on it. And then Moses, you see, see him sitting there. Those bibs he is wearing uh, were my bibs as a baby. So kind of a special picture. So uh, Moses is pretty awesome. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I'm a U.S. missionary with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. Uh, that comes from 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 20, where the Apostle Paul writes and says, We're Christ's ambassadors to the world, reconciling the, the world to God through Jesus Christ. The New Testament was originally written in Greek, and so the first Greek letter of the word Christ is Chi, and the first Greek letter of the word ambassadors is Alpha. So we're Chi Alpha. We go to the universities, and we build relationships with students, with professors, with coaches, with janitors, anybody involved with the, the university, so that we can see the world transformed for the glory of God. Uh, next slide, please. So we came over here about two and a half years ago, and as Pastor said, I live in Bloomington. And so we're in the process of planning Chi Alpha at three schools. Uh, the big one's Illinois State University, a school of about 23,000 uh, we're also planning it at Heartland Community College, a school of about mm, 4,500, and then also at Illinois Westland, which is a school of about 2,000. So we've got about 3,000 college students over in Bloomington Normal, and uh, we are just believing God for wonderful things. You'll hear uh, today he's already doing some great things, uh, but we've got a lot of work because our vision is for every student and professor to experience the gospel and become a disciple maker. Uh, that's what we're about, and it's going to take a long time to get there. But we know Jesus is faithful to take us to there. Now you go to the next slide, please. So uh, as you can imagine, the past year and a half has been kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and so we've had to adapt and modify and figure out things. Um, Y'all are a little more country than we are. Uh, where we are, it's pr been pretty tight, pretty rigid on restrictions and mandates, etc., um, so we had to adapt. So this is us at, in the backyard of the Chi Alpha house doing our core group stuff um, outside. Um, but through it all, God has been faithful, like we were just singing. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, just give you an overall picture of what God is doing in the state of Illinois. Um, Chi Alpha, it's been kind of interesting uh, here in the state of Illinois. You've had down in Carbondale just a decades of really great ministry down there, very uh, influential with international students. Uh, Chicago started up five, six years ago doing some great things, but kind of this big hollow section in the middle, if we're being honest. Peoria's had some good things here and there. Uh, even we at Illinois State have had some things, but I just want to give you a picture. So this was our fall retreat uh, about a month ago, and just to give you a feel, God is birthing something, and it's really exciting. So we've got over 100 students here who came together for a weekend, uh, many students, including one of our own who I'm water baptizing today, gave their life to Jesus in front of the whole retreat. And so I just want to say thank you uh, as a missionary that you guys support and pray for. Thank you. Uh, because I know sometimes you put the money in the box or online and you wonder, right? I do. Like, what is this accomplishing? That. Like, that's what it's accomplishing. And this is just the beginning. I mean, I know we live in a weird world where everything seems dark and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Can I just say it's going to get better and better for the church? Because we belong to Jesus. And this is Jesus' world and everything in it. And so if you think he's done, I'm sorry, you've got it completely backwards. 
He's just beginning. And the beginning, I want to share with you today, the beginning, I believe, starts today. And so uh, today, if you've got something you could take some notes on, this would be really helpful. Uh, if you don't have, you could take your phone out and take screenshots. That doesn't bother me in the bit. I don't, I'm used to students having phones in their hands all day. Uh, but I think there's some things you're going to need to know today. Um, and I think, I want to thank, uh, Fred, what's your name here? You're on the mic. Rodney, Rodney. Rodney. So uh, as I was here, I was driving over this morning, about an hour and 20-minute drive, and I was here this morning praying, and I felt like God needed to speak to us prophetically. And I was asking him to almost the entire worship time. And then I was wondering if it was going to happen because Pastor Craig just wouldn't stop singing. I'm like, stop singing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're good friends if you didn't know that. Uh, but then, like, all of a sudden, you were praying, and it came through. And so I think God has spoken to us prophetically today, and that prophetic word is this. Are we willing to repent? Now, hang for a second. We hear that, we're like, oh. That's because there's a lot of misunderstanding with what the word repent means. The word repent means to change how you think. That's what it means to repent. Are we willing to change how we think? And that's the question Jesus has for every one of his disciples. Are we willing to continually change how we think? I don't know if you've ever read the Bible. Sorry, this is not on script back there. Sorry, just give me a second. Uh, the Bible is full of incredible godly men and women who have serious issues and who have to continually change how they think. What did Jesus say about John the Baptist? He says, I tell you the truth about John. There's no one ever born who's been greater than John the Baptist. And as John is in prison and he sends disciples to Jesus, what do they ask him? Jesus, are you, are you the expected one or should we look for another? Come again? Weren't they second cousins? Didn't John know who Jesus was? And what does Jesus say back? Oh, bless John's heart. He's just a little confused and sad because he's in prison. No. He basically says back to him, John, you need to repent. You need to change how you think. Right? Church, we need to be willing to change how we think. This is a privilege I get every day being on university. I'm 42. I'll be 43 uh, two weeks from today, actually. Uh, that officially qualifies me for creepy old guy on campus. Right? Like, I could be all of their dads. And it's not even close now. Right? So don't just think, like, I waltz into campus and, like, the, the multitudes flock to me, right? I got to work to get in their life. Are you, hearing, are you hearing what I'm saying? I have to continually repent. I have to change how I think in order to connect them to how good Jesus is. So this morning, you don't need to stand up. You don't need to you do whatever you need to do. But my question to start today, are we willing to repent? Are we willing to repent? We'll go to the slides now. God's desire has been clear from the beginning. Genesis 12, his initial covenant with Abraham. This is what he tells Abraham. He says, in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Go to the next slide, please. There's a map we're going to put up. Jesus one of the uh, big statements he continually gives throughout the Old Testament to his Jews is, I want to take you someplace. Where did Jesus want to take the Jews to? Two words. The what? Something land. The promised land. Where is the promised land? Well, sorry. Right there, right? Notice it's basically right in the middle of all the known world at that time. All the roads, all the trade circuits, everything passed right through the promised land. Why did God want his people to be right there? So that he could influence the world through them. So he could restore the world back to himself. He wants to restore what happened at the Tower of Babel. Isaiah 34, Isaiah says, Draw near, O nations, to hear, and give attention, O peoples, let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. Ezekiel adds, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. This would be a good spot to talk about what are nations. Well, oftentimes we think of map, right, and boundaries. and That's not what Jesus is talking about. Nations are people groups. People groups, different types of people, different ethnicities, different people with different ways of thinking who don't look like us, talk like us, or think like us. He wants the nations to restored back to himself. And the Apostle Paul says this as he's writing to his disciple, Timothy. 
He says, God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's desire is clear, isn't it? He wants all the nations restored back to himself. That's what Father wants. The question we're going to tackle this morning is how? How is that going to happen? This morning, if you're taking notes, please jot this down. God's desire for the nations to be restored will be accomplished only one way, through discipleship. Through discipleship. That is how God's word will be accomplished. Jesus says this, a very famous passage. I'm guessing most of you have heard it. It's called the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Jesus says this. His last words to his disciples were, Go therefore and make what? Disciples of who? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You're like, yeah, yeah, we get that. We hear it all the time. Can we just pause for a moment and repent? Let's change how we think. Who is he telling this to? Who were these guys? Specifically, they were Jews. Hey, Jews, and they had a, a well ironclad mantra, an ironclad theology of it's us against the world. It's us away from the world. If I had, a, if I had a two o'clock, I'd unpack it for you. But uh, through Babylon and everything of that nature, they really cloistered themselves off from the world. Jesus' final words to them weren't like, hang in there, boys, I'm with you, don't be afraid. Well, that's part of what he said. But he gave them purpose with it, right? Now then, because I am with you, what? Go make disciples. Okay, cool. Who are we going to disciple? The Jews in the diaspora, the Jews who have been spread? No, the nations. And church, sometimes I wonder if we don't fall in kind of that same way of thinking sometimes. Where we're like, man, you're right. I need to encourage my brother. I need to encourage my sister in the Lord. Yeah, you do. That's great. But while you're doing that, especially go and make disciples of people who have no clue who Jesus is. So this command has a directive. Make disciples. Today, some of this might challenge you a little bit, so hang with me, though. Make disciples. He doesn't say go make converts. He doesn't say go make believers. He doesn't say go make moralists, which, I'll be honest, I travel a lot. Some churches I go to, I kind of pick up that vibe. Think like us politically, dress like us, talk like us, and you're good. Sorry, that's very, very dangerous. We are to make disciples of the kingdom of God. They're not supposed to look like me. They're supposed to look like Jesus, right? That's dangerous, isn't it? We can't control it. Like, there's things happening, and that's why it's called the gospel. It's a powerful message. So there, the command has a directive, but the command also has a focus. The focus is the nations. So let's start off this morning. What is discipleship? What is discipleship? The word disciple is a Greek word meaning mathetes, which literally means learner, someone who's continually learning. So if you feel like you've reached a place where you don't need to learn anymore, you're just waiting for the sweet by and by, you need to repent because we need to be learning until the day that we go home to Jesus. What are we called to learn? That's the next great question to ask. What are we called to learn? Specifically, we are called to learn the ways and the teachings of our rabbi. Now, this is going to be challenging. Any? Well, I, should, I shouldn't presume. Any Jews in the room? Jewish people? All right. We're all Gentiles. Us Gentiles. We're going to learn this together. All right. So we're going to learn the ways of our rabbi, Jesus. And if you're here not a believer yet, cool. Come and hear about this rabbi. He's amazing. Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill now, this is really important. The word fulfill means this, to interpret the text correctly and to back it up with how you live. Hear that again. To, interp to fulfill means to interpret the text correctly and then to back it up with how you live. You ever been around someone who's a great Bible teacher, but you get to know them, they're a real jerk? Or they're real shallow? Do you want to walk with them? Mm, not so much, right? Sorry, some of you are like, what, there's people like that? Yeah, unfortunately there are. Not a lot, but there are some. Okay. But the great thing about Jesus is not only could he teach like no one else could teach, he lived like no one else lived. He was all in on this kingdom. He lived out perfectly what he taught. Why? 
Because Jesus not only knows the Word of God, John 1 tells us He is the Word of God. He lives it out perfectly. So, rabbis would extend an invitation to their disciples. Are you ready for it? Two words. It's on the screen. They would say, follow me. So Jesus isn't like making this up. Like this is already commonplace. A rabbi would walk up to a person and say, follow me. What then would happen is if that person wanted to follow you, whatever they had in their hand at that moment, they would go. So now you know why, which is that the disciples, when Jesus invited them to go, what did they drop? Anyone remember? Their nets, right? They were fishing. Uh, what did uh, Matthew drop? His tax collecting booth, right? On and on. You go through all of them, right? That was how it worked. And so Jesus, being a Jewish rabbi, invited these guys to follow me. They dropped their stuff and they began to follow. That's what discipleship is. Now, let's look at biblical discipleship. If you've written nothing down, write this next statement down. Biblical discipleship is the process of following Rabbi Jesus in such a way as to move from unbelief to belief in every area of life. The process of following Rabbi Jesus in such a way as to move from unbelief to belief in every area of life. Discipleship, then, is not simply for those who have made a commitment to follow Jesus. Discipleship, church, is the means. It is the means by which we become followers of Jesus. Discipleship begins when the relationship begins. When you meet someone, hi, my name's Jason, you meet them, discipleship has begun. Not once they come forward for an altar call. No, that's great. That's a great step in their pursuit of Rabbi Jesus. But discipleship's already ongoing. Discipleship church is the defining mark of a follower. It is the defining mark of a follower. We got a quote we're going to put up from Mike Breen. Can you go next slide, please? We need to understand the church as the effect of discipleship and not the cause. If you make disciples, you will always get the church. But if you make a church, you will rarely get disciples. Church, Jesus is building his church. Jesus is restoring the nations. And Jesus is accomplishing this through discipleship. Can we all just like turn around for one moment if possible? See that little wall back there with all the missionaries? I was standing out there reading them all. So they probably don't share a lot of this when they come because, can I be this real today? All right, we're here. I'll, I'll leave shortly. And, uh, but we face a temptation as missionaries when we come to churches to tell like the big boo story, right? We are doing this big thing, da, da, da. But can I tell you what almost all of them are doing? I know almost all of them. Discipleship. Like they're going to countries around the world, some of them here, and they're just meeting people and praying. And as God opens doors, they're investing kingdom truths. And here's the cool thing. God is just using all that. And he's raising up people who some of them hated God. Some of them didn't know who God was. Some of them were actually worshiping Satan. Some of them were other religions. And they're having real life encounters with Jesus. And then they're going and they're making disciples. That's what all those people are doing. Isn't that amazing? Because that's what God wants to do here in Canton. He's not waiting for the right pastoral staff to come together, though they're wonderful. He's waiting for a church to be his church. He's waiting for people who are like, you know what, God, I don't know a lot. I don't even know if I'm doing this right, but I am willing. Boom, God invades. He's in that, and he'll use you to change the nations. Let's start off today by who are we discipling? Who are these people? You can put the next slide up, please. All right, so this is a picture from earlier this year. Sorry, it's not the best picture, but see the guy in the hat, second from your left? His name's David. So David's a sophomore at ISU. Uh, He's a townie. He's from Normal. And I began discipling David uh, a year and change ago and walking with him just through life. And he gave me permission to share this. He was a church kid. And he was confused by a lot of things, a little skeptical, a little cynical. And then I just began opening up my life, letting him walk in. And today we're going to end by looking at what I did. Um, And man, as he began to encounter not, hear me, the Jesus he should follow, but the Jesus he knew to love and want to follow. As he encountered him, 
I mean, man, his life just began to spill out. And there's days David will text me 20 and 30 times, like pretty regularly. And we'll explain all this, why this is important later. But I respond back, and I journey with him, and we eat and drink coffee. And I don't drink, he drinks coffee. But we, we get to, we're together a lot. And journeying with him and walking with him through it, okay? But understand one of the critical things that I began to instill with him from the beginning is that God wants to use you to change the world. God wants to use you to make disciples. And David said to me, I can remember, he said, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm willing. Now, this is the beginning of school year. This is late August. The guy to his left is about as unsaved as you get. And David, in his words, he's a super nerd. Like, he's wicked smart. He's great with computers. Great kid. But he knows nothing about sports. And by nothing, let me tell you, nothing. I'm a big sports guy. So he's like, no, wait, what's happening? Okay, so David is trying to reach this kid, okay? And this kid loves one thing. Guess what he loves? Sports. Well, he's from Chicago, okay? He's a freshman. And he's like, oh, man, I'm just so disappointed. We're hanging out, eating whatever. And uh, he's like, well, David's like, why are you disappointed? He's like, well, my, my high school, he went to some big Catholic school up there. We're playing, playing, our, playing our rival other whatever school. Sorry, I don't know Chicago very well. Um, he's like, I'm just really disappointed because I want my dad to come down and pick me up so I go to the game. He's not going to be able to do it. And David goes, I'll take you. He's like, for real? He's like, yeah, I'll take you. He's like, okay. And he's texting, <laughs> he's texting me. He's like, is that cool? I'm like, yeah, do it. So he goes, and then the little gal to his right, she's another one of our student leaders, Sierra. She's like, hey, I'll come along. And then the guy on the far right, his name's Jamal. He's also fresh from Chicago. He's like, yeah, I'll hop in. So off they go. They drive two and a half hours to some area of Chicago, watch the game. David has no clue what's happening the entire time. Uh, They end up going to the game. They stop. They get food. They get back at like 3.30 in the morning. And David is up the next, it would be a Saturday morning, texting me at 7.30. Can I call you? Like, yeah, man, what's going on? And he's like, guess what happened? Went to the game. He's like, you know, connected with this guy. It was great. But then on the ride home, Jamal rode shotgun. So Jamal's father is a Muslim. His mother is a Catholic, and he says he's an atheist. Like David, he's a fellow nerd, super smart kid, computers. I mean, these guys, like, they talk stuff. I don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, really intelligent. And as they're riding home, as he's riding home shotgun at 1 o'clock in the morning, Jamal begins to ask him questions about God. Jamal begins to ask him questions about the inerrancy of Scripture. Jamal begins to ask him all these kingdom-based questions, okay? Now, understand, if we were playing, we play a thing, something called glow-in-the-dark volleyball. We have a volleyball that glows up at night. We light all the nets. It's on campus, right? It's all late at night. So that's how we met Jamal. He loves that stuff. He loves to eat. But Bible study, no, <laughs> no, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. However, in a car ride home, as he spent the evening together building relationships, laughing, you know, cutting it up, whatever, doing stuff 19-year-olds do, God began to change Jamal. And Jamal began to open up and ask questions. To the extent that two weeks ago, we had our, our missions week in Chi Alpha. We bring in missionaries from all over the world, exposing our students, most of them don't even know what a missionary is, to missions for five days in a row. Jamal came all five days. Okay, Jamal is leaning in. Today he'll be there. I know he'll be there because he's exploring. So now, with all that in mind, I might circle back to that in a minute. Who are these people we're trying to disciple? First, they're people almost completely unaware of whom Jesus is. So older folks in the room, I love you. My dad is uh, 73. He, he's like, I just, I can't believe that. But I say, Dad, this generation of students has no concept of who Jesus is. So if you're in the room, you find that unbelievable, I'm sorry, be willing to repent right now. Like, they don't know who he is. Yeah, they've heard the name and a cuss word. They've heard the, you know, historical Jesus. But living Jesus, they have no concept of who he is. Second, this generation are people who use titles that they do not often fully comprehend. Be careful with this generation. I'm not just talking about the young people. I'm talking about people in the world. They use titles they don't really know. Words like atheist, agnostic, spiritual none, those get thrown around all the time. They mean nothing to me as a missionary. I don't care. To be honest, the word Christian doesn't mean a lot to me either (laughs) until you actually get to know them. 
Uh, like, because it can mean a million different things. So when someone throws up, well, hey, I'm an atheist. Ooh, ooh, hey, all right, hey. Okay, cool. Hey, did you watch the Bears game today? You know, like, don't let it mean anything to you. Don't let titles mean anything to you. Next, there are people highly broken, lonely, confused, and skeptical of authority. And that's going to come into play here in a little bit. They are very skeptical of people who are in charge. And finally, there are people, hear this, desperate, all caps, desperate, for authenticity, community, and acceptance. People desperate for authenticity, community, and acceptance. They're dying for it. Now, you're like, man, that's depressing. Oh, you're hearing it backwards again. Oh, no, no, no. This is all wonderful news. What I'm telling you is the world are a people who are primed and ready for good news. They're ready for some good news. Have you lived in the world the last year and a half? Good news is welcome right now, right? Oh, great. We have the best news to give them. We have a God who doesn't love you when you perform well. We have a God who loves you so much he performed well for you on the cross. He doesn't need you to be a good Christian boy, a good Christian girl. He just needs you to trust him. And if you'll trust him, he's going to show you a better way. Now, it's going to terrify you at times, but it's going to be wonderful. Come with us. That's who we're discipling. Now, let's look at how should we think. Now that we know who they are, how should we think? First, we need to think as the visiting team. Let me explain this. America is post-Christian. And I'm sure I'm going to have one or two of you get it mad with me and come talk to me after service. I usually get it. But it, it is. Sorry, friends. It's post-Christian. America is not a Christian nation anymore. I, I get it. I get it. Founding fathers. I know, I'm not talking about founding fathers. I'm talking about right now. Like, people don't know who Jesus is. They don't know who Jesus is. So we have to understand. Pay attention to this, especially if you've been in church a long time. The vast majority of our culture doesn't understand the language, culture, or purpose of the church. The vast majority of culture doesn't understand the language, culture, or purpose of the church. I had a guy one time tell me, I got this guy at work I'm trying to lead to Jesus. He doesn't seem to want to hear it. So I'm just going to keep talking to him like he's saved until he gets saved. Thank you for that horrendous face in the back. That's what I did. I'm like, oh, hey, <laughs> can we talk for a second? That's about the worst thing you could do, Right? Go to where they are, speak their language, learn their culture, because Jesus, he infiltrates every culture that's ever been. Not expect them to jump up to us. We go to them. We are the visiting team. Second, people must belong before they believe. People must belong before they believe. Could you put the next slide up, please? Finish the line. Jesus, friend of? Ooh, that should have been a better response to that one. Jesus, friend of? Sinners. sinners. What is Jesus always doing in the Gospels? Good. Someone said he's always eating. You ever notice this? He's constantly eating. And who's he eating with? Right or wrong people? Ooh, in the religious eyes, they were the wrong people. But in the kingdom eyes, they were the right people. Isn't that interesting? We need to understand something. People need to belong before they believe. We need to give them space to feel loved, accepted, and appreciated before they're going to believe anything. Jamal needs some time, doesn't he? Just to be, to discover who he is and who Jesus is before we can expect him to believe anything. People belong before they believe. Third, we must resist the tendency of microwaving the process. We have to resist microwaving the, proce the process. The gospels reveal to us not only a healthy theology, who God is, what his kingdom is, what his kingdom's about, but they also reveal to us a healthy methodology. Jesus spent three plus years with how many guys? How many? Twelve. And one of them what? Betrayed him. Discipleship is a messy process. I just got betrayed this year. It's real life. It happens. But we don't stop, right? And we don't hurry the process either. Come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. Man, what's the problem? I've been praying for them for two and a half weeks. How come they've not given their life to Jesus? Oh, my gosh, really? Like, it could be many more years. 
or it could be tonight. We don't know, nor is it our job to know. We don't need to microwave the process. Next, we must earn the right to speak into people's lives. We must earn the right to speak into people's lives. Maybe you've heard the statement before, people don't care, mu- care how much you know until they what? Until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's so apropos for our society today. I mean, you ever been around somebody who has all the right answers, but no one can stand them? They're smug, they're arrogant. Nobody wants to hear them talk, right? Because we know you know a lot, but what we don't know is, do you care at all? But then have you ever also been around somebody who is very loving, very caring, even though they don't know a lot? Do you enjoy being around them? Of course, right? Because you know they love you, and they appreciate you, and they accept you. We need to be those people who love first before we impart knowledge. We have to earn the right to speak into their life. Next, we must look in, excuse me, we must look past people's problems and into their potential. We must look past people's problems and into their potential. Here's the cool thing about Psalm 139. It says that Jesus was weaving each one of us and every person out in the world together with fear, wonder, and awe. And part of that is gifts. You know, God has gifted everyone in the world with gifts. Like, I have to work through our students through this. They're like, now, wait a second. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and my professor's an atheist, and he's wicked smart, right? They're like, wait, how does that work? Because if he he doesn't fear God at all, then how does he have so much knowledge? Because, what do you say back to the college student? This is what I say back. Because when they were in the womb, Jesus was weaving their brain together and giving them a mind And it's their choice as to use it whether they're going to glorify Jesus with it or they're going to glorify themselves with it. But it's still a gift from God, right? It's still a gift. Similarly, there's people in the world who seem challenging to us, who are like, how could we ever reach them? Can we be really honest? There's people you and I don't like in the world. But understand, Jesus has given them gifts And he wants those gifts to be used for his glory, okay? We have to look past those things we don't like in them. We have to look past their personality that rubs us the wrong way. Get past it and look to the gifts. Now, I don't want to drift too far on this. That doesn't mean we look past dysfunction. just want to be very real with you, very honest with you. One of the things I've found over the years, I've been doing campus ministry now 19 years, is that church kids really struggle with people who are dysfunctional in the church and no one's saying anything to them about it. Okay? Like, there's a place for dysfunction, but it's not the first place. Right? We have to build meaningful relationships with them before we get them straightened out. Because what I hear so often is people saying, I'm going to get them cleaned up and bring them to church. (sighs) Can we, like, Flip that hardcore and maybe cut off the end too. <laughs> you know, like, no, it's not our job to clean anyone up. The Holy Spirit will take care of that. That's his role. Uh, it's our job is to be the body of Christ to them. Next, discipleship is two-way traffic, not one way. Discipleship is two-way traffic, not one way. And this is going to be one that you might be like, ooh, that's hard to swallow. Hear me out. Discipleship has to be done in community. It has to be. We disciple each other, and we will be discipled as we disciple. You're like, I don't know about that. Okay, I'll give you a for instance. Have you ever been talking to maybe a brand new believer at church? And you're like, hey, how was your week? And they're like, oh, it was great. You're like, oh, what was, what was great about it? Man, I shared Jesus with five people this week. How about you? Oh, um, hmm right? And then hit your heart, you know? You're like, I didn't share Jesus with anybody. Wait a second, though. I'm the mature one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? What's happening there? What are they doing to you? They are, they're discipling you, right? It's not meant to make you feel bad. It's meant to get you charged up. Like, if this brand new guy and Jesus is going to share his faith, dude, I'm sharing my faith, right? I'm going to go out and I'm going to engage people this week with good news, right? They're discipling you, Discipleship is two-way traffic. What I'm trying to tell you is 
Today, many of you are like, yeah, you're right. I need to get out there and do it. Oh, you're only getting half of it. The other half is you're going to get totally blessed while you start discipling people. They're going to blow your mind away. David, this kid, you're like, gee, she texts you 20, 30 times a day. Such a blessing to me. Why? Because I get to help him. But as he's reading the Bible for the first time, he's asking me questions about things I've never even seen before. And I'm growing in my walk with God because of it. Right? It's two-way traffic. So good news. It's not all just work for us. We're going to get blessed while we do it. Next, discipleship shifts the focus from the pulpit to the kitchen. Discipleship shifts the focus from the pulpit to the kitchen. Can you give me a little grace here? I'm going to step on your toes just a touch. Here we go. No one answered. Can I do that once? Okay, here we go. So here's what I want you to stop doing. I love you. Stop saying this. What do I have to do to get them to church? What do I got to do to get them to church? Can you... Stop doing that and start doing this. How can I go to them and be the church? How can I go to them and be the church? How can I go into their world instead of trying to get them to come into mine? Jesus didn't shout down from heaven, did he? Hey, you bunch of messed up Jews, right? I'm up here. You're all focused on all this silly stuff. Figure out how to get up here, right? But John tells us in his gospel that he came, John chapter 1, and it says he tabernacled amongst us. He made a home. And if you fast forward to the end of your Bible, the Revelation, do you know where Jesus spends all of eternity? In the middle of us. And he still has scars. He still has holes in his hands. That's our king. The God who comes in our midst and makes us his own. And now we, as Chi Alpha, we as Christ's ambassadors, what are we called to do? The same thing. To go into people's lives. To go into where they are. You ever notice how relaxed? You ever walk into a kitchen that's got like a nice, uh, like a, what do they call those, coffee bars? The high raise up thing? What do people do? Right? You sit up there and you lean on the counter and you have awesome conversations, Right? Then you bring your very unsaved friend to church, right? And then what are they like? Right? You know what I'm saying? Which would you prefer to talk to them? Which environment would be better? Kitchen, right? Because they're relaxed. They're relaxed. And that's where we want people to be relaxed. We want them to be authentic because Jesus can encounter them in that place. All right. Now, I'm going to start to take it home now. Practical steps. How do we begin discipling these people? Three words. Classroom, apprenticeship, and immersion. Classroom, apprenticeship, and immersion. As the church, and I'm speaking stereotypically, we pay the most attention to his teachings, as we should. Amen. But that's really the classroom component of it, right? But John writes something interesting in the end of his gospel. John chapter 20, verse 21. He says that we have a very small sample size of what Jesus did for three plus years. For three plus years, what was he doing? Apprenticeship and immersion. But somehow in the church, we kind of got a little out of balance. We've spent all our time focusing on classroom, his teachings. But what we're going to find today is that healthy disciples are made when all three happen. So let's look first at classroom. Classroom is good for facts and information. Uh, Jesus' teachings happened in a multitude of settings, styles of purposes. He's speaking all different kinds of ways. Um, But his teaching revealed what the kingdom was, right? And it revealed who the king was himself. And this would inspire change. But here's what you need to know. Classroom is probably, and I'm making this up, but I think it's fairly accurate. Classroom is probably 10% of discipleship. Probably 10%. It's important but it's not everything. Next is apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is the investment of time, energy, skills, and life. The investment of time, energy, skills, and life. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready to respond? That was a test, not a very good response. Are you ready to respond? Hey, thanks, buddy. All right. So if I want to fix my drain... Or if I want to learn how to do knee surgery, two options. Option A, I go and I read some really good books. 
Option B, I go and I spend time next to a plumber and a surgeon. Which do you recommend, A or B? B. Okay. B, why so strong B? Why, if you're having knee problems, can I read a book and then I'll operate on you this afternoon? Are you cool with that? No. Why aren't you? Because I know something and I don't know something. Right? I know all the right answers from reading the book, but what do I lack? Experience. Can we just let this sink in? What's wrong with this world? What's wrong with these politicians? What's wrong with all these people? Uh, They lack apprenticeship. They've never had someone to come alongside and show them a better way. Jesus says this in Luke 11. Pay attention to this verse. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, I want to try to say it how, this is how I'm imagining that they said it. Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, and on he goes. Now, let's let that sit up for just a second. Isn't this interesting? Jesus is a good teacher, yes or no? Amazing. Best ever? Without a doubt. When he's teaching in a certain place, what were they thinking about while he was teaching amazingly? Isn't that interesting? They weren't like pondering the great truths that he was teaching, but they're like, I don't get how to pray. Probably like Pastor Craig's up here dropping some truths sometimes, and you're like, I wonder what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight. <laughs> right? Like, I wonder what he thought of me when he looked at me like that last night. Or, man, why is grandma always on my back? And he's like dropping like boom from heaven, right? Can I be this real today? Am I the only one whose mind drifts occasionally? Okay. But we see what the disciples' mind was drifting to while God himself in the flesh is teaching. They want someone to show them a better way. They've been praying. I've heard people teach, like, they didn't know how to pray. That's totally wrong. These are good Jewish boys. They knew how to pray. But what they wanted is what John gave to his disciples. You know, John had his own disciples before Jesus. And in fact, a few of them were Jesus' disciples, right? And they saw John model to pray. And they're like, hey, Jesus, will you do that for us? And what does Jesus say? Boom, without missing a beat, here's how you pray. Can I just tell you the world around you doesn't know what to do? They got no clue what to do, man. Oh, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. You ever talk to people? Like all the mantra you hear in the media, no one believes that. You're like, well, how do you know? Because I live on a college campus, man. Like I got friends, like they're from all over the world and no one thinks that way. But you know what they're all looking for? Someone they could do an apprenticeship with. And so before you get mad at Canton and the people of Canton, the leadership of Canton, evaluate, are you willing to go and show some people a better way? Here's the same statement we say, whoever spends the most time wins. And everyone's got something in their pocket or their purse right now that you got to battle against. What's that called? A phone, right? That phone is making disciples, let me tell you. But the Spirit of God is greater than that phone. If we're willing, we'll make better disciples. Finally, immersion. Immersion. The best way to learn a language is to be immersed in it, right? To be immersed in a culture, in a language. If you wanted to learn Portuguese, yeah, you could get whatever cool thing they have to learn the language, but the best thing we can do is buy you a ticket to Brazil, right? Drop you off, give you a ticket back in six months. You're going to come back and you're going to know it, aren't you? Why? Because you're going to be immersed in it. You're going to be immersed in it. And God's going to change your life through it. I'll land the plane today with this. Where do we start? I can tell just by looking at you that some of you are like, I want to do this. But I'm guessing the next response is, I don't know what to do. Show of hands, can we be honest today? Raise your hand if you're like, I don't know how to disciple somebody. All right, some of you do, some don't. Okay, cool. Well, assuming you don't, we'll start here. The first thing I want you to do today is to pray. Pray. Here's what I want you to pray. Again, if you've written nothing down, write this down. Because it's a specific prayer I want you to pray. 
Lord, who are you already working in? Okay? Sometimes we mistake, we get our theology messed up. We're like, I need to go to my work. Man, ain't God ain't in that place. Ooh, pump the brakes on that. Because Psalm 24 tells us the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. God is at work everywhere. Can I just be honest, as a missionary for 19 years, I've learned enough to know I know nothing. I used to think on campus, like, hey, that guy, that girl, I bet she's open to the gospel. Right? I go up there and they're like, get away. <laughs> right? They don't want anything to do with it. And I've seen other people, I'm like, no, that ain't going to work. And the Holy Spirit's like, go, go. And I'm like, no, no, go, go, right? I go up to them, they're like, you know, boom. And now they're like missionaries around the world. You know? <laughs> like, we know so little, and that's what we got to pray. Specifically ask, when you walk into your school, to your work, to your community, Lord, who are you already working in? Second, bells. Did I share this last time I was here, Pastor? All right, so this is really good. I can say that because it's not mine. <laughs> I'm not being arrogant. So this is from a, a, a colleague named Michael Frost. You go to the next slide, please. So there's going to be a series of slides here. So bells is an acrostic. You're going to like this. So if you're like, man, I want to engage somebody, but I don't know what to do, right? You get sweaty hands, butterflies in your stomach, and you're like, oh, I want to share Jesus, but it's just so nerve-wracking. about to give you some really good news. Are you ready? First, the B is bless. How can I bless this person? Can I give them a gift? Can I, um, uh, uh, words of affirmation, can I touch, whatever, you ever heard of love languages? Figure out what their love language is and how can I bless them? Um, I have so many incredible stories of this of professors and people like that who opened up because one of our students brought them a gift. No one gives them gifts. So when you do, people are like, who are you? Bless people. That's how the relationship starts. You're going to love the second one. Go ahead. Eat. Yes. If you love to eat, you're a disciple of the kingdom of God, right? So everyone around you does something 21 times a week, at least. Eat, right? They eat. Now, what I'm not saying is take every meal. No, stop. Here's what we challenge our students with. Two things. Number one, can you take one meal a week to encourage a brother or sister in the Lord with? You're sitting down, eating your food, and you're just going to encourage them and bless them. And they're probably going to start doing that to you. And you're probably going to start praying for people you're trying to engage with the gospel. That's one meal. The second meal, can you take one meal a week and eat with somebody who doesn't know Jesus? That didn't say go take them a sermon. Eat a meal with them. Sit knee to knee with them. Because when you sit knee to knee, God changes people. He changes people. Eat with them. Bless them. Start the relationship there. Hey, would you like to grab a cup of coffee sometime? Hey, you want to grab lunch? And obviously, if you can, pay for their things. If not, that's fine. But take them out. Bless them. Next, Listen. So this is what I get. And I, I, by the way, I'll hang out here for a while after I can answer questions. People always ask, okay, like, I want to I engage people. Like, what do I do? Okay, so I took out a young man uh, for lunch uh, a year and change ago. They're normal. He is a young man who's struggling with his sexuality. Uh, thinks, he's, thinks he's a girl. But he's really into guys. You know, all this mess, da, da, da. Okay, now, what do you do? Well, I'm, but here's what I do. Hey, what kind of food do you like? I love Mexican food. So I thought of the most expensive Mexican place I could in town. I'm like, hey, you want to go there? He's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'll buy. Okay. Right? We set a time. We go there and we eat. Right? So I'm blessing him. And I'm offering to eat with him. We sit down. Hey, how's your week? You know, we're making small talk. Get our menus. We order. Right? Then you give away your menus. And here's the awkward moment. Right? In your eye to eye. And this is where people are like, what do I say? I don't know what to say. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you what to say. Here it comes. You ready? Can I hear your story? And they'll probably look at you kind of like, what, what do you mean? Can I hear about your life? And the follow-up question is usually, like, how much do you want to know? And answer this way, all of it. Or whatever you want to share. So this young man whose parents are in the church, it's a dysfunctional home, he's confused, thinks he's this, thinks he's that, da, 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 talked for 45 minutes about his life. Then he ends, and he's like, can I hear about your life? Guess what I shared? My life. And here's the interesting thing. He didn't push back from a table or get grumpy face. He's like, huh. 
It's a Friday afternoon. We talked for about an hour and a half. We're done eating. I said, hey, it's Friday afternoon. I realize you probably got a lot of things to do. I'll let you go now. And this is what he says back to me. Actually, can you stay and talk a little longer? Sure. And we stayed probably another hour. Talked about life. It's interesting for a man who says he's an atheist. He kept talking about Jesus. It's interesting how that works. So here's why we bring up the L for listen. As you are eating, say, can I hear your story? Listen. Listen for where do they need good news, the second L. Learn. Learn. Learn where they need good news. You'll hear it come through. People share their brokenness. Dad was never around. Dad was always in the garage working on the car. I pick on dads a lot because dads are usually the problem. (laughs) True. I got five, right? Uh, But you'll hear it, okay? When you hear that, now you can learn what good news they need to hear. So when I get told dad wasn't around or like one of my students, I'll probably run out of time I tell, but when dad raped me for eight months when I was a little boy, Okay, they don't need, well, hey, 1 Corinthians 15, tell, they don't need that. They need to hear, do you, I'm really sorry your daddy did that to you. But do you know your real daddy would never do that to you? Do you know that when that was happening by your earthly daddy, your real dad was there? And your real dad's here now. And your real dad wants to heal you. So desperate to heal you, young man, that he sent his own son here. And his son took a beating you and I deserved and he bore stripes on his back so you could be healed in your soul. And he can renew your mind. Dude, I've told that to atheists before. What do they do? Most of them cry. You're like, that's awesome. Here's how you get there, though. And the, finally, the S. And this is going to make no sense. Send. Send them. We usually think of sending as Christians. But I want to tell you, send people before they've made any commitment to Jesus. The Bible is full of people who Jesus sends out, who just had an encounter with Jesus. No commitment, including 12 disciples. Right? It wasn't, John tells us it wasn't until the end of uh, Jesus' life, before he gets ready to ascend to heaven. He says, he, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, they became born-again Christians. And what had he already done? Th- done? Send them out two by two, Right? Send people. Get that in their DNA. Because once they give their life to Jesus, all they're going to know is changing the world for Jesus. Send them. Send them. Bells. Who does this? Next slide. Everyone. Everyone prays. Everyone gives. Everyone goes. Everyone welcomes. This is one of our mantras in Chi Alpha. Half our students, at least in our ministry right now, are not born again. Half of them would identify as some A-word, atheist, agnostic. I'm this, I'm not, I'm a spiritual nun. So when I say everyone, who am I talking about in Chi Alpha? Oh, everyone. Still? Yes. Jamal, an atheist, came all five days to Missions Week. There is a, not to speak down to y'all, because you're young people. There's a fire in these young people's souls. They don't want to just live and make some money. They want to change the world. I'm going to Momentum next weekend, okay? We're going to be there as Chi Alpha trying to connect with these students as they're going to college. But understand why we're going there. We believe in them because they're not just going to go through the motions and church, they're not going to mail it in. And that's really good news. They want to be legit. They want to be authentic. And so when we challenge students, we challenge the Jamals in our ministry, they don't shrink back, they rise up. Jesus was a great rabbi. He never lowered the bar. He always brought it up higher and people always rose up and met it. Everyone prays, everyone gives, everyone goes. Number three, identify your Peter, James, and John. What what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus modeled for us how to disciple people, didn't he? And he spent time, yes, with the 12, but mainly with the three. We call this a rabbinical havara, a rabbinical havara. That is, as people would follow a rabbi from town to town, there would be a group. But nearest him would be his Havra, those closest to him, his disciples closest to him. And the one closest to him would always be the elder disciple. Why? Because he would ask the questions for the group following rabbi. 
What disciple do we always see talking to Jesus in the Gospels? Starts with a P and ends with a R. Peter, right? Peter. Why? Because he's the loud one. No, he's the oldest one. We think Peter was probably 18, 19 years old. They're all a bunch of teenagers. We think John the Beloved was probably 11 years old. James, probably 12. You're like, how do you know that? Because when Jesus calls them to come follow me, who's in the boat with them? Their dad. I.e., they're not Jewish men yet. And that happened when you become 13. So why is Peter always talking? Because he's the old one. He is the one nearest Jesus. So when Peter talks, he's not just talking for himself. He's talking for the crew. Okay? Now, Understand that within the 12, yeah, Jesus had special moments with Andrew. He had special moments with Matthew. But only Peter, James, and John got to go up the mountain to see the transfiguration. And on and on I could go. Here's what I'm saying to you. Jesus is modeling a methodology for us. You can't disciple 15 people. You can disciple three. Okay? You can't give all this rare access to your life with 100 different people. You got time for three. And here's what I want to hammer home. You can't rush this process. You have to pray. I've been here almost three years now. I had to pray for a year and a half before I got David. A year and a half. Like, I moved here <laughs> from Indiana. And it took that long. So don't rush the process. And this is going to be really hard, and this is why a pastor can help you. Because you're going to see potential in people. You're like, oh, I see potential. Students, you're going to see school students. People at work, you're going to see them. You're like, oh, it's such great kingdom potential. But if they don't want it, they don't want it. So we got to pray until they're a place of following. Two more things and I'll end. Fourth, give them classroom, apprenticeship, and immersion. Here are the keys to this. Here are the keys. Please jot this down. Authenticity, vulnerability, modeling, and empowering. I'll say it again. Authenticity, vulnerability, modeling, and empowering. I'm constantly telling stories about how I screw up. <laughs> like, I do a lot because I mess up a lot. Okay? I share how I was short with my wife. I share how I raised my voice at my kids. I share how I didn't do this right. Why? Gosh, you're going to lose respect in people's eyes. Actually, no, they lean into that. Because people are keenly aware of how broken they are. We have to model that. But we also have to empower them. And this is terrifying. You're going to be with them and put them in spots where things could go bad, and that's okay. So today, I want to encourage you. I want to bless you in the name of Jesus. You can fail well for the kingdom of God. Fail well. Pastor Craig, can I speak to you? I bet, I bet this pastor wants you all to begin failing all over Canton. Go fail well, because it ain't about you. It's about Jesus. And maybe he'll use your failure for his glory. You ever heard of a guy named Moses? I could never be a Moses. Ah, you're probably more like Moses than you think. Because when God comes to Moses, Moses rised up and accepted that challenge, didn't he? Uh, hardly, right? He's like, will you send anybody else at one point? But his main cause was, I must... Th 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 stutter, right? So, and then finally, like, can like Aaron come and like talk for me? God's like, okay, <laughs> right? So before you put these people up on a pedestal, I could never be like, oh, you're just like them. We just, we're just like them. And God will use us if we'll go. And did you notice as Moses went, Aaron's doing all the talking, but what quickly begins to happen? Aaron steps back and Moses is talking. Amen. Why? Because Aaron, his brother, probably full of wisdom, started off, and he's like, Moses, you need to do this. And finally, he's like, Moses. Poosh. Moses stepped up, and God took over. And there's people God's going to call you to disciple, who you, they're going to stand on your shoulders, and they're going to accomplish more for the kingdom than you ever could. Can I be honest? That's my dream. These people I'm reaching, that they'll <laughs> blow me away. And they already are. Like, they're David. First time, you know what first words out of David's mouth when I, when I took him out for ice cream? Just want to let you know I'm very antisocial. <laughs> Literally, first word, it's hilarious. First words, I'm anti just want to let you know I'm antisocial. Now the kid meets like a new person almost every 
other day. I'm not even exaggerating. Why? Because as soon as he goes down in the dining hall, by the way, he lives at home, but he moved and lives in the dorm now so he can live more missionally. And by the way, when he did it, he said, I don't want to take on debt. What should I do? I said, let's ask. James says, you have not because you ask not. He said, sounds good. I said, how much do you need, David? I need $4,000. Sounds good. Wednesday afternoon, he tells me that. The next day, Thursday morning, he texts me, all caps, I must call you. Like, call me. Guess what happened? What? ISU just gave me a grant for $4,000. I'm moving to the dorms. True story. True story. And now David can't stop meeting people. Okay? Challenge your three to go find their three. It's crucial to instill in them DNA of going. So here's what I want to tell you. As you're out there, a term I want you to know is persons of peace. Here's what you look for. You got to take some risks. You got to share about Jesus and about his kingdom. Persons of peace. What's a person of peace? Well, when you talk about Jesus, you ever had those people like kind of like recoil and like, okay, that's not a person of peace. But have you ever noticed that sometimes you share about Jesus, there's someone who kind of leans in a little bit. And they're not put off by that at all. That's called biblically a person of peace. And if you read the book of Acts, that's what they begin doing. As the gospel begins to spread into the areas that were very non-Jewish, they would go, and as they would go into a city, where would Paul go first? Synagogue, right? He would proclaim it to the Jews, and then quickly it would shift to the Gentiles. What area would he use there? Well, he would go out into the public, and he would begin sharing Jesus a little bit, and he was looking around. And here's what he found. He found half doing this, and the other half going, huh. And guess who he spent his time with? The hunt people. And a lot of them, we know their names. Titus is one. Right? On and on, all the letters tell us, all these different people. They were persons of peace. In your schools, in your work, in your communities, and in your families, there are persons of peace. So can we just be willing to repent today? Can we be willing to change how we think and know, Jesus, we don't know what you know. God, the the people who seem the hardest hearted, the furthest away, are actually right at the doorstep of the kingdom of God. So Lord, who are you already working in? When you get your three, it might take you a while. You might have one for a while. Maybe then maybe you'll get two. From the beginning, challenge them to go and each of them raise up, raise up their own three. And if we'll do that, Acts 17, verse 10. And the, the charge against the disciples were, and they were turning the world upside down. Lord, may that be the charge against you and me. May we turn the world upside down. Thank you.